This week on Q&A, a professor of economics and a filmmaker team up to make rap videos explaining economic philosophy. Our guests are Russ Roberts, who teaches at George Mason University, and John Popola, former creative director at Spike TV. Russ Roberts, when did you decide to teach economics through rap? Oh, really, when I was about 12 years old, I thought, you know, doesn't every young boy dream of that? No, uh, I got contacted by John Popola out of the blue. He listened to my podcast, Econ Talk. He said, let's do a video together. I thought, great idea. I don't have time for that. If you do a lot of the work and get us started, I'll pay attention to you. John turned out to be an extremely persistent person. We started off with the idea of doing a video on just teaching some aspect of economics. It strangely morphed into a rap video of Keynes and Hayek, such as the creative process. Well, we'll dissect Keynes and Hayek in a moment. I noticed on YouTube this morning, John Popolo, there were 2,281,000 views of of the first video you did. Which was the first one? Uh, Fear the Boom and Bust. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Is that a lot of hits? Two million some? Well, it's not as much as comic videos about cats. But, you know, that's a high bar. So I think as far as videos about economics, it's pretty good. And I think, more, you know, perhaps most interestingly, that video came out over a year ago. It got consistently, long after sort of the, the first pop, uh, 3,000 views a day, like every day, like day in, day out, which is sort of amazing to me that it would sort of sustain at that level. We're going to look mostly today at the second video. What's that called? The fight of the century. What's the basis? Uh, we wanted to look at whether the stimulus package had worked. We wanted to go back in history. Look at how Keynes and Hayek debated that a long time ago. Look at the role of the Great Depression in this debate about whether government spending can create prosperity and get us out of recession. So we wanted to focus on that. How did you approach this one maybe differently than you did the first one? Well, I think um, we wanted to make it sort of bigger and better in every way from a you know, visual and, you know, audio way. So, you know, the song, I think, is a much, you know, bigger, bolder song. We've got a, a sung refrain by Rich Murphy, Eddie Murphy's brother. And, um, and you know, I think the other thing, too, is in a lot of ways, this one is sort of complementary to Fear the Boom and Bust, where Fear the Boom and Bust was this sort of theoretical textbook macro jargon. And this video is much more sort of the political economy and sort of the applied theory. So they're really talking about how do these things impact the real world. So you've got to talk about the depression. You've got to talk about the incentives of politicians in, in deficit spending. Let's watch the first minute or so of this, and then you can dissect it all. Lord, Lord Keynes, wow, it's, it, it, it's, it's such an honor. Indeed, sir. Please, just go, just go right on through. Whoa, whoa. No. Identification, please. Hayek. No, oh, Hayek. Like um, high explosives. High, high explosives. Yeah. We have a 1066. HQ, I repeat, we have a 1066. Copy that, Mike. What is, what is a 1066? That was just an example of how to pronounce my John Popolo, what were we watching? What, what was that scene? So, you know, one of the things we try to do with this one, which mirrors the first, is to, to sort of set up the context for these two personalities. And obviously we're making a little dig at the TSA there too, which is always fun. Um, it's good for viral views. <laughs> um, which is that, you know, Keynes is a, is a big figure in the world of politics, in the world of economics, as it's been taught in the mainstream. And people know his name, people know stimulus, people, it's part of the vernacular. Whereas Hayek, I mean, you can come across incredibly accomplished economists who don't really know much about Hayek. So he's very much an underdog in terms of the rhetoric. I mean, he won a Nobel Prize for his business cycle theory, so it's not like he's a completely heterodox figure. But um, we wanted to sort of set the table that this is sort of the, the landscape rhetorically and culturally. Where were they checking in to? They're, they're on there. So scene wise, you know, this is the beginning of a, a Senate hearing, or I guess it's just a congressional hearing more in general. We don't sort of distinguish. 
Uh, and so they're, they're, they're on their way in to testify on behalf of the role of government spending in the economy. And, uh, and that's the security checkpoint at the entrance. Russ Roberts, who was John Maynard Keynes? John Maynard Keynes is probably the most influential economist of the 20th century, although Hayek, I think, is in the running. He's just not as loud and brash. But his theories in the 30s were used as a justification for a lot of government spending and dominated macroeconomic business cycle theories, theories of recession, depression, for roughly 40 years until the 70s when things somehow went awry. So-called Phillips curve, the relation between inflation and employment wasn't holding the way Keynesian models thought. And Keynes fell out of favor in the 80s and 90s in, in the academy among academic economists. But come a big recession, he's back in favor again because he gives people an excuse to spend money uh, and, and in the name of, of saving things. So he is uh, a huge figure. He had an outsized personality. We use his charm as part of the theme in the, in the videos because he was a very charismatic man and, and very attractive to, to all kinds of folks who wanted to be around him. So we, we make him the more uh, popular guy in the videos, and Hayek's always struggling for respect. Let's watch some more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the committee, we are here today to consider the impact of government spending on our economy. We're fortunate to have two world-renowned economists to offer their testimony on the matter. I see you took a detour down the road to serfdom. Talk about the end of laissez-faire. Sheesh. <laughs> well, shake it off, Freddy. I'm not pulling any punches in there. I'm ready. Are you? Prepare for the return of the master. <laughs> John Maynard Keynes. F.A. Hayek. Round two. Round 2.0. Same economists. Same beliefs. New microphones, new mustaches. John Popola, what are we seeing in that? I mean, right there on the screen, who are those two characters supposed to be in real life? <laughs> well, in real life, the, the gentleman with the beard and the and the um, the friar tuck is uh, is a certain Fed chairman. He's a he's a stylized Fed chairman, though. You know, he's a. Uh, I'll leave it to the audience, but. Um, and it's also my dad. That is your dad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and how about the other fellow? So, you know, and then sort of he's surrounded by, you know, people who represent essentially, I guess you could say like the broker dealers, the actual big money center banks that the Fed interacts with that sort of have this odd relationship with this government agency where they both sit on its board, but then also buy and sell securities with it and... Sometimes turn to it when they get into a pinch. Who's that fellow right sitting on the right of uh, Ben Bernanke? In, in uh, is that? I mean, there was a, a point that we somebody thought it was Mr. Geithner, the Treasury Secretary. Oh no, uh, no, no, it's it's not. Um, yeah, they're they're sort of uh, they're no one in particular. So I, I, yeah, there's no name associated with that particular gentleman in the real world. Rush Roberts, what are you trying to accomplish with this? With with the video? Yeah. We're trying to give people an understanding of, one, the economic argument between these two people, the argument for what we call the top-down approach to recovery, which is the Keynesian approach versus the bottom-up approach of, of Hayek. Uh, most people just presume that if you spend money, you create jobs. And we argue that didn't happen uh, in, in the past. When we stopped spending money at the end of World War II, jobs didn't disappear. In fact, the economy did very well. We argue there's not a lot of evidence for the Keynesian model, and we argue really that the whole idea of macroeconomics isn't as scientific as economists like to pretend that it is. Uh, Hayek in 1974, when he got the Nobel Prize, wrote a very <clears throat> powerful piece called The Pretense of Knowledge. He uses those lyrics in, his song, in our song where he says, the economy is not a class you can master in college. To think otherwise is the pretense of knowledge. And we argue that Economists often act as if economics is a precise science. We're going to create 37,582 jobs, or this is going to cost 16,455 jobs. That's fake science. That's what I call scientism. The use of scientific technology and jargon to give an aura of certainty that doesn't really exist. So that was our goal. Our goal was to get people to think about both sides of this question, whether stimulus and government spending actually is the road to prosperity. And secondly, to get a little skeptical about the scientific nature of economics, which Hayek was a major skeptic about. 
Who wrote the song? It was us together. I mean, it really was. I mean, so it's one of the things that's most exciting about this project is that, um, you know, like, we, like Russ said, I reached out to him as a listener of Econ Talk. And so I was trying to educate myself about economics, having never studied it formally. But Russ has also written f fictional books and, uh, you know, is a very just creative person. So um, sort of it, it's a very un unlikely balance of, you know, sort of really down the middle, 50-50, writing the lyrics together, bringing ideas to the table, and then bringing ideas to the table visually. Um, it's, it's, it's a great collaboration and a friendship, and that's what it's all about for You us. live in New York. In New Jersey, for now. <laughs> Close. You live in <laughs> Maryland. Maryland. Work in How did you two get to know each other, and from what perch were you on when you got to know each other? <clears throat> well, we spent a lot of time on the phone and a lot of time emailing before we ever met face to face. We wrote, I think, two songs before we uh, before we actually met face to face. We wrote a preliminary song that didn't make it. We decided to reject before we wrote uh, Fear the Boom and Bust. Uh, we didn't write the music, by the way. The music was written by Richard Jacobs who's a great, a great composer, but the lyrics are John and I. And I. What were you doing, and why did you <clears throat> get to know Russ Roberts? Uh, well, up until recently, I was full-time as a creative director in, uh, at a broadcast um, cable network. Which one? Um, Spike TV, which does not endorse nor uh, associate <laughs> directly with our work, but I have a lot of, a lot of great support from my, my colleagues there. It's a, great, it's a great organization. It's a great group of people. And, um, and as, as essentially the, the combination of the election cycle in 2007, 2008, and then the financial crisis, really with Bear Stearns, uh, that just sparked my interest in these ideas in economics. And, um, you know, I was very inspired by the Ron Paul campaign and the way that he was talking about, I mean, how many people talk about monetary policy in a political setting other than him? That nobody. Now, now it is. And the fact that that happened, the fact that you had this, this lone voice talking about the role of money and monetary policy in the economy, followed by this crash uh, and, this, and this sudden, I mean, you know, we, we had Ben Bernanke appear for the first time in 90 years to give a press conference. And I, that just struck me as there's a story here that isn't being told. And as a media person, as a creative person, I think I have the tools to tell it in a different way. And so that's why I reached out to Russ. You said Econ Talk was the way you got to know that he existed. What is Econ Talk? It's my weekly podcast where I interview economists, authors, uh, the woman who cuts my wife's hair, the guy who sold me my car, Nobel Prize winners. It's a uh, hour-long conversation on economic issues of the day. Where do you do it? I do it out of my office uh, at George Mason, but it's a Liberty Fund project. You can find that on the web at econtalk.org. It comes out every week, 6.30 a.m. Monday morning. There's You're about 250 of them on the web. Available. You're at George Mason University yes. here in Virginia. Yep. Uh, Econ Talk is a podcast. Yep. How do you find it? Uh, you can find it on iTunes. You can Google it. Um, you go to iTunes and just search for Econ Talk, you'll find it. And what was your past before you got into Spike TV? Well, you know, I went to film school and at Penn State University. And then... Um, I've been essentially a, a member of the Viacom family for my whole career. I got out of school and started off at the bottom rung as a production assistant at MTV in the animation group. And then I worked for uh, Nickelodeon, which is, uh, which is where I met my wife and I, also where I met my, then, my, my, my boss then and then uh, boss and friend Niels at Spike. And so when, when Niels left Nickelodeon to go to Spike, he, I said, take me with you. That sounds exciting. He said, all right, come aboard. And um, and then for the you know seven years up until this April where I where we, we left to start a new venture, um, I was a spike. The first video was actually released when came out the end of January uh, two thousand and ten. And that's the one that has two thousand or million. two million hits, and the other one that we've been watching has about seven hundred some thousand yeah. today. Yeah, Correct. Right. let's watch a little bit of the rap that you've put together here. Here we are, peace out, great recession Thanks to me, as you see, we're not in a depression Recovery, destiny, if you follow my lesson Lord Keynes, here I come, line up for the procession We brought out the shovels and we're still in a ditch and still digging Don't you think it's time for a switch from that hair of the dog? Friend, the party is over, the long run is here, it's time to get sober Are you kidding? My cure works perfectly fine Have a look, the great recession ended back in 09 I deserve credit, things would have been worse All the estimates 
estimates prove it. I'll quote chapter and verse. Econometricians, they're ever so pious. Are they doing real science or confirming their bias? Their Keynesian models are tidy and neat, but that top-down approach is a fatal conceit. Oh. Which way should we choose? More bottom up or more top down? The fight continues. Keynes and Hayek second round. Uh, John Papola, I have to ask you, who is the chairman there, the, the uh, African-American gentleman? Who's he supposed to be in Congress? Anybody in particular? No, he, I mean, really, that's Rich, so that's Rich Murphy, who uh, is awesome. He's a great singer. And uh, Richard Jacobs, the, uh, the composer, had worked with him before. And so when Russ and I s decided we really wanted to bring a different element to the song to break up the rapping um, with something melodic, Richard recommended um, Richard recommended Rich, and that's that's how that came about. Who are the two actors that are out front? That's Billy and Adam. So they are uh, improv comedians. They also have a really um, hilarious group called the Harvard Sailing Team. But my wife Lisa actually found them. She she's uh, I met her at, when I was at, Nickelode at Nickelodeon. So she's also a TV professional. Um, we had tried a couple, uh, I guess, up and coming rappers in the early stage of developing for the boom and bust and it just it wasn't quite fitting you know there was <laughs> it's an odd project and you sort of need to you sort of need to commit to it and just take the time to get the intonations right and the the sense of what it is and i turned to my wife who can find anything she's like a mega producer and i said we need we need basically two guys that look somewhat like Keynes and Hayek that can comedically rap and she found them in like a week. <laughs> so, and, how old are they? Uh, they're in their they're they're in their late twenties. I I think, pretty sure. <laughs> um, they're they're just amazing people. They're incredible, hardworking professionals and just great human beings. They're they're awesome. Russ Roberts, tell us more about the two characters that they're playing. Uh, Friedrich von Hayek was from what country? When did he live? What were the basics that he stood for? So Hayek was born in 1899, so he's a 19th century guy in a sort of a kind of a sense, born in Austria. Um, ends up spending important time in the early part of his career in England, where he meets Keynes, they become friends, which is part of the what we try to bring out in these songs, that they were respectful of each other, they were friends, they argued. I've actually seen uh, their, the postcards they wrote to each other. I've touched them uh, out at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, where I also have an appointment. They have the high, a lot of Hayek stuff, and they have their postcards back and forth. And they call each other Keynes and Hayek, by the way, by, by last names. We have Keynes calling him Freddie for fun because he's British. But um, so Hayek, uh, he also spends time in the United States. Uh, he ends up in the University of Chicago for a while, not in the economics department. So he was uh, he had an incredible career spanning a huge part of the 20th century. I think he died in 1992. Um, he was important for a whole bunch of reasons. The Road to Serfdom is the book most people think of. It's not the book I recommend. I would prefer The Fatal Conceit. I think that's more about the economics and, and politics of what he wrote about. But he wrote about politics, economics, neuroscience, incredible uh, breadth of, of knowledge and interest, and uh, had an impact on economics very much so in the 30s and 40s, was kind of a forgotten figure, gets the Nobel Prize in, in the 70s, and really has a rebirth uh, that we're trying to encourage. Uh, we think his ideas are, are very important still today. Didn't you graduate from the University of Chicago? I did. I'm a Uni University of Chicago PhD. Did you ever meet him? I did not. Uh, he, again, he was a quiet figure. He was not an important figure in the department. Um, I was required to read his most fam one of his most famous articles, The Use of Knowledge in Society, which he wrote in 1945. Used to be on graduate student reading lists, probably as not much anymore but I think still a very important, influential, uh, incredibly important paper about how prices signal and steer information in a modern economy. Where was John Maynard Keynes educated? He's a, a, a British economist. Uh, I want to say he went to... King's know, College, Cambridge, I think. Cambridge, yeah. I, uh, and he, of course, his young career, he was most famous for the economic consequences of the peace, where he said that the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War I was going to lead to disaster. He was right. Uh, it was very prescient. That made his reputation. He also wrote influential books on probability, monetary theory, but his giant work came out in 1936, the general, general theory of 
income, now again, John knows this better than I do, income, money, and employment. Interest, employment, and money. Interest, yeah. employment, and money. <laughs> Thank you, John. I, see, I haven't read it since, you know, 1977. When did he live? Uh, Keynes li uh, died in, John, you going to help me here, late 40s? I, th I think 46. 48, 46? I think so. There's a poignant correspondence between Keynes and Hayek at the end of Keynes's life where Hayek is worried about inflation and Keynes says, no, don't worry, I'll just, I'll nip it in the bud, I'll tell my supporters that, you know, it's time to stop. But he dies. Uh, we get the sort of post-war era, 50s, 60s, starting this inflationary growth happens that ends up with the stagflation in the 70s. I'm a little worried we're about to get another dose of that uh, here in the 2000 and teens. We'll see. Your education. Yeah, so like I said, I actually, um, I just have an undergrad with uh, film and TV from Penn State. But no, e uh, the reason I asked that was no, no econ economics? None. It's his well, um, <laughs> is it I guess advantage? I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of do think it's an advantage, although it, it's, it's sort of, it's a, it's a dangerous thing because there's so much, there's a lot of allure in economics and it can give you this false sense that you sort of understand the world and it's very easy from either perspective, from a free market or a more uh, interventionist perspective, to say, oh, I've got it all in my head and I, it's, a, it's this system and I, I you know, this is how it works and and uh, and so it's 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 a challenge to sort of stay humble about your understanding the more you get into it and the more you read and that's part of why I mean that was really part of what attracted me to Russ's podcast so much is that he um, not only does he treat his guests with whom I think both of us would often disagree intellectually with a lot of respect and dignity but he also you know approaches his own biases or his own point of view with a lot of even skepticism that you know there's only so and, and, and that is a very Hayekian point that we were trying to make in the video that there's limits to what we can know and be wary of of your certainty with regard to the economy. Which one of these economists Hayek or Keynes is dominating the thought in the United States today? Well I guess it depends on how you look at it I, th I would have to say it's still very much Keynes though I think people who are adamant fans of his would say the say Hayek. I mean, the fact that um, we're approaching, you know, we've hit this debt ceiling, which is a kind of strange, arbitrary law, and it's like the world is going to come crashing down. Like, how could we not? How can we not spend more money? How, how can we possibly imagine balancing the budget? And and so there there is a Keynesian bias that's sort of natural to government. Um, and, and then just even more generally, I mean, when every time Christmas rolls around and people talk about how important the, the, the Christmas spending is going to be for the economy, that our economy is built on consumption. I mean, that's a bizarre, from my point of view, it's a bizarre idea to think about that consuming wealth is how we create it. It's a weird. What's the biggest difference between being a Keynesian and a, and a Hayekian? Well, what we've been talking about right now, we decided to spend 800 and it turned out to be about 820 billion dollars uh, that we borrowed. We've ratcheted up government spending dramatically uh, in the hopes of creating jobs. The Keynesians will tell you we didn't spend enough. That's why it didn't work better. Um, what would have been enough in their uh, Well, I, Paul Krugman said two trillion would have been a good number. Um, there's no worry in his mind about the implications of that for people's confidence in the future facing higher taxes. The Keynesians tend to be looking more at the short run. The Hayekians tend to be looking more at the long run. The other part of Hayek we haven't talked about that's so important is the political incentives. Hayek spent a lot of time worrying about who responds to the incentives, who's drawn to power, what happens to them once they get in power. Um, the plans of politicians really don't always end up off the economics department drawing board. They tend to respond to political incentives. So I think that's a hugely important difference. Hayek emphasized that and um, politically powerful get get the goods. Uh, the people who don't have political power don't get the goods. Let's watch some more, uh, but before we do that, uh, how long is this video in its entirety? If you include the credits, it's just uh, just over 10 minutes. Some more music. It's time to wait in, or from the top or from the ground. Let's listen to the great saints and high down. We could have done better had we only spent more. Too bad that only happens.
happens when there's a world war. You can carb all you want about stats and regression. Do you deny World War II cut short the depression? Wow, one data point and you're jumping for joy. The last time I checked, wars only destroy. There was no multiplier. Consumption just shrank as we used scarce resources for every new tank. Pretty perverse to call that prosperity. Ration meat, ration butter, a life of austerity. When that war spending ended, your friends cried disaster. Yet the economy thrived and grew faster. Where did you do all this? We filmed uh, the entirety of this video at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. They had, and this is just part of the pro, I mean, filmmaking is a lot like a giant construction job. And you've got to hire your right, the right crew, you've got to scout your location and find the right plot, which in this case, Drew offered a, a nice big auditorium where we could stage that boxing scene and then this beautiful, I don't think it was quite a chapel, but it had a kind of chapel-like feel to it. But that wasn't really the, the point. It was, you know, this sort of nice mahogany classic environment where we could have our sort of timeless congressional hearing. When did you do it? We did it on um, <laughs> two long days. <laughs> two long days, um, April 16th and 17th, so over the weekend. And then um, my partner Josh and I, uh, Josh had an um, unbelievable edit already done two days after. We, we couldn't, we really got very excited about it. We couldn't. Couldn't go to sleep. Once, once we had it in the can, we had to get to work. So it actually debuted only 10 days after we were done shooting. And how much did it cost you? Um, well, it should have cost <laughs> about a quarter of a million dollars. It did not cost that. It, didn't, it wasn't dramatically below that. But, um, you know, we pulled a lot of favors and didn't make very much money on it or anything like that. So... Um, but that's about, from a production value, how do you do that? How do you reproduce that? Two hundred to $250,000 is about right. And where did you get the money? We raised the money from people who were excited about the project. We have a website, econstories.tv, where we have the videos, the lyrics. You can download. It's all free, by the way. There's no, you can get the songs. Um, and we have other material up there if you want to learn more about Keynes and Hayek. We have essays, podcasts, other video, videos we've done with other scholars, uh, Larry White of George Mason and Robert Skidelsky, uh, Keynes' biographer, so you can watch videos there. And basically we went out and reached out to people who we thought would be passionate about this kind of economics project. And it, it has a great appeal to the high school and college audience, by the way. A lot of people have watched it in high schools, and a lot of people are excited about people learning about good economics uh, at the high school and college level. So at my blog, Cafe Hayek, I advertised it, uh, we, you could donate there, and we went out and raised money. So it all came from private donors who were passionate about economic education. I t trust that you're a big Hayek follower. I am. <laughs> uh, and when did you... We, we like Hayek, by the way. We tried, to give, we tried to give Keynes his due. We try to be faithful and honest to his viewpoint. Uh, he looks better. He has all kinds of pluses going for him, but we actually do like Hayek. Yeah. When did you start that? The high, interest in Hayek? Yeah. Um, it goes back... Uh, a long way. To, I had some interest in him in graduate school back in the 70s, but coming to George Mason, which has a strong interest in Austrian economics, chairman of the department when I got there was Don Boudreau, who's an enormous Hayek fan, turned me on to a lot of Hayek's essays and books. And uh, my last book, The Price of Everything, is really an attempt to bring Hayek's ideas about microeconomics into a fictional context. So I'm, I'm deep into Hayek. Let's do some more video. You only see what you want to see. The spending on war clearly goose GDP. Unemployment was over, almost down to zero. That's why I'm the master. That's why I'm the hero. Creating employment's a straightforward craft. When the nation's at war and there's a draft. If every worker was staffed in the army and fleet, we'd have full employment and nothing to eat. People work to live better, to put food on the shelves. Real growth means production of what people demand. That's entrepreneurship, not your central plan. My solution is simple. 
and easy to handle. It's spending that matters. Why is that such a scandal? Money sloshes through the pipes and the sluices, revitalizing the economy's juices. It's just like an engine that's stalled and gone dark. To bring it to life, we need a quick spark. Spending's the lifeblood that gets the flow going. Where it goes doesn't matter. Just get spending flow. You see slack in some sectors as a general glut, but some sectors are healthy. Only some in a rut. So spending's not free. That's the heart of the matter. Too much is wasted as cronies get fatter. So what's the subtlety of say on the back or S A Y on the back of the? Uh... So <laughs> this is this is my proudest contribution to the econ of the of the video. <laughs> um, uh, John Baptista Say and and uh, Thomas Malthus essentially had a a version of the Keynes Hayek debate a hundred years before Keynes and Hayek, which is also part of why we call it sort of fight of the century. It's fight of the centuries, back and forward. You know, it's not going to stop. It didn't, and it didn't start with them. Um, we're, but we're basically, you know, the debate went that, that you know, uh, Malthus believed that you could have a general glut of goods, that there could be overproduction, and that insufficient, essentially spending, insufficient demand for goods in general uh, could cause, a, is that was the cause of recession, and that's what a recession was. And Say, on the other side, said, no, you know, that's not, spending's not the nature of, of prosperity or the source of our purchasing power. You first have to produce something that someone else wants, and only through that process do you have the means to purchase other things. So I have to go to my job and make money so that I can go and buy a house or buy a car. Um, that, gets, that gets reinterpreted in a very strange way as supply creates its own demand, which sounds like you can go in your backyard and make a mud pie and magically someone will appear to buy it. That's not what Say was talking about. He was saying that production, uh, which is fairly ele elemental when you think about it, is the source of your purchasing power. You have to be productive to be able to buy things. And that, you know, if, if spending in one area collapses because people made some mistakes, th that capital and that interest will flow into other areas. And so you would have shifting sectors. And so that was something I really cared a lot about this and I wanted to make sure it got in the video. And uh, Russ and I debated like, is it too much? Is it too geeky? Or, you know, you know how important is it? But, um, you know, we... Uh, Did anybody figure it out in a blog somewhere what exactly you were doing? Did they analyze this? Sure. Oh, yeah. And we've got, we've got uh, Mises, who was Hayek's great teacher uh, in Hayek's corner. And we have Hicks. You don't see much of him, but we have Hicks and Keynes's corner also, who was a great popularizer of Keynes's views. So those are their corner corner men. If if we were hoping we were going to film them in between rounds, feeding them articles in Book Street, we didn't quite weren't quite able to get that in. But um, that we wanted to make a little tip of the hat to their intellectual influences. Who do you, th when you're writing this kind of stuff, wh who do you think of as the viewer? We're trying to reach people who are interested in how the world works. Uh, that's everybody from a high school student who's curious about economics to a person who's just trying to make a living and get along and is worried about what's going on in Washington or in the country. Um, we tried to make these lyrics accessible, a little bit amusing. Um, I, I have to admit, I actually enjoy listening to it still. It's a little bit, it's a little bit weird. I'm not a rap fan, but I, I'm getting into it now. I, it's, and it, I get, I get emails from grown-ups who say, "I watch this with my kid. I'm into rap now. My kid's into economics." <laughs> that was part of our goal to reach people, uh, reach people. That we, I had a, um, a woman write me that her her uh, her, her fourth grader watched it and liked it. I had a guy tell me his fifth graders mastered all the lyrics and had a friend over and was showing it to his friend. He said, dude, you don't know anything about Austrian economics? Uh, that's, our, that's the sweet spot for us, to get p kids, 10's a little young maybe, but <laughs> to get kids in high school and college and curious people everywhere to find out more about these ideas um, is really why we, why we did this. And it's very gratifying. How, how did you test it to see if people understood it? We or didn't. <laughs> Yeah, I, I sort of am in the Steve Jobs school of you don't focus group. <laughs> you know, the creative process is just so, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging and it's very, very subjective and it's collaborative and there's already so many collaborators involved, myself, Russ and myself and Josh who edited and shot, uh, shot uh, part, parts of it and the, the cinematographer and, you know, and there's so many compromises of, of the logistics of it. 
you know, you, you it rains and you can't get the shot you wanted to get, so you have to rethink the way it has to happen. Or it snows and you're hoping you're going to get a Rolls Royce limo in that first movie, but the guy who owns it won't let it out of the out of the garage on a snow day. The yeah. first one you did was in New York in snow. Yeah. Twenty inches the day before we <laughs> shot it, so it almost never happened. <laughs> now, is there any money being made on showing this on YouTube? No, not now. There's uh, some ads that run on, on the it, first but it's, one. I mean, it's a, a pittance. It's yeah. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> we have a, almost a two-minute clip of uh, the discussion of Wall Street and bailout and government oversight. Um, and it's, it shows Hayek gives Keynes a big punch and Keynes goes down. Why the boxing thing? What's that? How did you set that up? Well, you know, where Fear the Boom and Bust had this pretty strong... Um, Metaphor, the your, drinking, your, your first the, first, video. the first video had like the sort of drinking and the party and then the, the hangover the day after. You know, this piece, what we were really trying to just establish is that this fight and this debate and this intellectual battle is timeless. You know, so that's why we have say in Mises and Malthus and that's why it has, a, you know, stylistically the look is, you know, sort of this golden nostalgic feel, even in the Senate hearing, which is theoretically modern day. But we, I, I hope that that's modern day 30 years from now that people watch it and say, when he says the recession ended back in 09, it's equivalent of someone today saying, oh, the depression ended back in 33, like some, some believe. Um, so that was it. It was, really, it was really a motif. It was just a kind of broad playground for us to have these ideas happen. And the chance to have the chair of the hearing be the referee of the boxing match, we were deeply attracted to that. That gave us a chance to make a little joke at the end about what role politicians play and deciding who's got the best arguments. And uh, that that was fun. And John really wanted to shoot a boxing scene, I think, yeah, too. Yeah, that, really, that was <laughs> we, a lot of fun. Lot. <laughs> uh, again, though, if somebody's watching and they want to watch both of these videos in their entirety, where do they go? Uh, they can go to econstories.tv or they can go to YouTube. If you Google Keynes rap, Hayek rap, Keynes and Hayek. In fact, it, it's, I don't know if I should be apologetic about this, but if you Google Keynes, our first video comes up on the first page. Um, that's his uh, little bit of his legacy now, for better or for worse. Two videos, YouTube or econstories.tv. All right, here's two more minutes. The economy's not a car, there's no engine to stall. No expert can fix it, there's no it at all. The economy's us. We don't need a mechanic. Put away the wrenches. The economy's organic. Which way should we choose? Both bottom up for more. Took down the fight continued. Case in high, it's second round. It's time to win. Or from the top or from the ground. Let's listen to the big sentence in high. So what would you do to help those unemployed? This is the question you seem to avoid. When we're in a mess, would you have us just wait doing nothing until markets equilibrate? I don't want to do nothing. There's plenty to do. The question I ponder is who plans for whom? Do I plan for myself or leave it to you? I want plans by the many, not by the few. Let's not repeat what created our troubles. I want real growth, not a series of bubbles. Stop bailing out losers. Let prices work. If we don't try to steer them, they won't go berserk. Come on, are you kidding? Don't Wall Street gyrations challenge a worldview of self regulation even you must admit that the lesson we've learned is more oversights needed or else we'll get burned oversight the government's long been in bed with those wall street execs and the firms that they bled capitalism's about profit and loss you bail at the losers there's no end to the cost the lesson i've learned is how little we know the world is complex not some circular flow the economy's not a class you can master in college to think otherwise is the pretense of knowledge situation where did you get the actors and oh. the and the um and not the two actors the main ones but the uh, all the extras the same place <laughs> i turned to lisa versace who knows how to get things done <laughs> so uh what we did is actually you know at this point we'd already had you know a, a decent following from our first video and so we reached out to essentially our fans on Facebook and on the internet and uh, my wife co uh, coordinated um, essentially people that are into what we're doing and 
wanted to be a part of it to come and participate. So there's a lot of, uh, it's not just a group of uh, background extras hired. It's uh, The, the uh, two names, and I wrote them down, Billy, is it Scafuri? That's right. And the other one is Adam Lustick. And you say that they're not 30 yet. No. Where did they learn how to dance that way? <laughs> <laughs> They've lived rich lives so far. So, so um, Yeah, you know what? They actually do comic rap on their own. So they've uh, they've got a number of albums already out with you know hilarious you know parody rap songs. So they've been doing this. They've been doing not quite this, but this kind of thing live for some time. When did you get interested, uh, Russ Roberts, in the new technologies, the the podcasting and things like that? And how did you know that it was going to have any impact at all? Well, I remember when I someone said to me, you know, you ought to you ought to have a blog, and I thought. Eh, I don't know about that. And so I didn't do that for a while. And then all of a sudden I realized, yeah, I should have a blog. That'd be fun. And I was late to blogging. And I thought, when I heard about podcasting, and somebody invited me to be a guest on a podcast, and I thought, I'm not going to be late to this. So I jumped into podcasting in 2006 wow. with with, uh, with Econ Talk and have been doing it for five years. And when I started, people said, uh, well, no one's going to want to listen to people talk about economics for an hour. I mean, five minutes is a long time on radio, but there is a big taste and demand out there for serious conversation and serious learning that's not textbook, it's not classroom, so it's not a lecture, but it's more of a conversation. I think that's the way we're hardwired actually to learn, is by talking and listening. And so what I try to create for our listeners, I try to ask the questions they'd ask. And so technology, that was an obvious thing. I noticed that people weren't reading as much as they used to. So radio, podcasting, like a good idea. But the, obviously, the big prize was always video. And so I'm thrilled that I've had the chance to collaborate with John, who has such an incredible visual imagination and the knowledge of economics to go with it. Because video is very time consuming, as we both know. We spend a yeah. lot of time on these projects. Uh, it, it's a blessing to do it with somebody who understands what I understand and has the same goals as I do. And I think in the modern era, I mean, I think about what it would have been like in 1995, the dark ages. Think about that. This is 15, 16 years ago. If we'd come up with this idea, we would have created a DVD, which would have been a modern thing. How would we have reached people with that? Well, we'd have had about a mailing list. We would have gone out there and tried to get people to, to, to ask for it or buy it. Here we can give it away for free. We have now about 3 million views of the videos that we've created combined. They've been subtitled in 11 languages. What an incredible world we live in, where you can anywhere in the world get access to this entertainment, these ideas in the format you want, whether it's print, audio, or visual. I saw on YouTube that, that these two actors in front of an economist seminar <laughs> of some kind, do you take this thing on the road now? <laughs> we did. <laughs> yeah, so, um, which is really, it is bizarre. It was, the, uh, it was the Economist magazine. They have this annual conference, the Buttonwood Gathering. And so they saw it as an opportunity to be, uh, you know, to lighten things up. Um, it's a tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they didn't laugh as much as they No, although I think yeah. Mervyn King might have been our biggest fan in the crowd, I have to say. Joe Stiglitz was there. Yeah, and uh, so it was an illustrious crowd, uh, which made it even weirder for me, who has no, no reason to be listened to, <laughs> to get up on stage with Russ and to opine about the problems with macroeconomic methodology. <laughs> Will you two did. do this more if, you, if people are interested? Sure, it's fun. But at that session, we had Billy and Adam sing. We wrote new lyrics for the old song, which became the jump start for the next song. That's right. Uh, that's when we realized, hey, we've got another song already, almost already written. Uh, it ended up, of course, not being true. We ended up adding about killing some verses and adding a bunch more. But that was the we called that the the, the sneak hole. It was kind of like the sneak preview of the next uh, of the next one. Here's the last section of this music, particular music video. This is about two minutes. You get on your high horse and you're off to the races I look at the world on a case-by-case -case basis When people are suffering, I roll up my sleeves And do what I can to cure our disease The future's uncertain, our outlooks are frail That's 
why free markets are so prone to fail in a volatile world we need more discretion so state intervention can counter depression people aren't chess men you move on a board at your whim their dreams and desires ignored with political incentives discretion's a joke those dials are twisting just mirrors and smoke we need stable rules and real market prices so prosperity emerges and cut short the crisis give us a chance so we can discover the most valuable ways to serve one another <laughs> Should we choose? Most bottom up for more top down. The fight continues. Gains in high, second bow. It's time to win. More from the top or from the ground. Let's listen to the great sight. Gains in high, it going down. John Popolo, you said uh, as we were watching that that was your sister there holding the microphone. That's right. I got my sister and earlier just in the in the crowd, my mom as well. So it was a, <laughs> it's a family affair. Where is your mom in this video? She's just, she's nodding her head along uh, in the in the crowd in some of the early shots. The li is it lip synced? That's right. So you you play back the song on set, and and they sing along, but to make sure that it's synchronized with the picture. Um, but in order for the performance to work, they do have to sing it there because if you just sort of mouth it, you know, our, our eyes are so attuned to the subtle changes in your face that come from singing versus not. And so you really, they have to belt it out and really perform it on, you know, live multiple times again and again over the course of the day. It's so if you're there in the room as it's being, uh, is it, do you just film this or tape it? Um, uh, we filmed it on uh, these brand new Sony cameras that, you know, are, you can shoot a Hollywood movie on these cameras. They're beautiful cameras. And did they, so if you're in the room, you hear them singing along with the, the, the actual song on a speaker somewhere. That's right. You know, you mentioned earlier, the, the interesting thing about this, this session with you both is that there are two stories here. One is the making of the video and the other is the economics of it. But go back to something that you said very early in our discussion here about the Liberty Fund based in Indianapolis. Yeah, their and foundation. And I looked on their board, and I only recognized, not that I should recognize anybody, I only recognized one name, and it was Mary Anastasia, I think that's the way he pronounces, O'Grady of the Wall Street Journal Editorial yeah. Board. Who are those folks, and what is that fund? Uh, Liberty Fund's a foundation in Indianapolis. It was created by an Indianapolis businessman, Mr. Goodrich. Uh, he was interested in the great books. He was interested in dialogue. He was interested in education. So Liberty Fund does a few things. They publish great works of economics. So a lot of the Adam Smith, the best works of Adam Smith that are out there today are Liberty Fund editions that they've done in collaboration with academic presses um, and other great books like that. They run conferences for scholars who sit around and talk about ideas. And then they have a web page, uh, EconLib, the Library of Economics of Liberty and the Online Library of, of Liberty, where they archive great works of economics. So my podcast is there. There's a blog, EconLib, which is a top 10 economics blog. Uh, we have all kinds of, I'm on the advisory board, we have all kinds of great works of economics. We have Karl Marx, we have some John Maynard Keynes, and we have some Adam Smith. We have the entire works of David Ricardo, which are not easy reading. I don't <laughs> recommend that lightly, but it's an enormous resource that's all no charge for anybody around the world who has access to the internet. Where does Liberty Fund get its money? Uh, they got it from Pierre Goodrich. This, this all the money's man. from him. As far as I know, it's his endowment. It's the endowment that's grown over time. They don't raise money. Uh, we don't charge for anything. People have written me saying, I love your podcast. Can I give you money? And Liberty Fund sort of says, mm. I mean, we, they'd probably take it, but they don't really raise money. How did you educate yourself about economics? Well, I mean, Russ's podcast played a big role. Um, and then also just reading books, although really audio books, because I get sick on the bus. I, had a long, I have a long commute. I used How long to, is your commute? It was almost four hours round trip. Every day. He's really smart. The beauty, <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of... Now. of uh, um, public transit in New York City area. And you would go from where to where every day? I would go from uh, Verona, New Jersey into Manhattan. And um, 
so I listened to a lot of Murray Rothbard, and uh, you know, I read some textbooks, which is weird. I watched a an intro macro class on my that was for free from SMS. I don't even know what school that is, but it was pretty interesting. I wanted to see sort of how it's normally taught, and I'm glad I didn't have to sit through that for real. We have a clip of the first video you did, which is already almost it's near eight million views. Um, and let's see what it's um, released when? Last April? In 2010? It, uh, yeah, January 25th, 2010. It's, it was like 2.3 million views. This one? I, the new one. Oh, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the old one. The yeah, the old one. one. I, seven million. That'd be nice. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> Maybe We're after this there. program, you'll get that. I yeah, hope so. I'm, I, I'm sure of it. Here's, <laughs> here's about a, first of all, before you show, what set up the, what this was about. This one really is um, almost an intro macro buzzword festival for Keynesian economics and, and Austrian business cycle theory. So you have Keynes first step through sort of the basic framework for his theory and why government spending can restore an em employment in theory. And then Hayek goes through his approach, which is, is very different um, about the role of monetary policy, because, you know, money is one side of every transaction, so it kind of makes sense that money would have system-wide effects. And the way that the credit cycle that the Fed creates induces the business cycle and causes what he calls malinvestments. Okay, let's watch. It's about a minute 18 of the first video you did. My general theories made quite an impression. Revolution. I transformed the econ profession. You know me, modesty. Still, I'm taking a bow. So say it loud and say it proud. We're all Keynesians now. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. I made my case, Freddie H. Listen up, can you hear it? I'll begin in broad strokes, just like my friend Keynes. His theory conceals the mechanics to change. That simple equation, too much aggregate. Ignores human action and motivation Yet it continues as a justification For bailouts, payoffs, by polls with machinations You provide them with cover to sell us a free lunch Then all that we're left with is debt and a bunch If you're living high on that cheap credit hog Don't look for a cure from the hair of the dog Real savings come first if you want to invest The market coordinates time with interest Your focus on spending is pushing on thread In the long run, my friend it's your theory that's dead So sorry there, buddy, if that sounds like invective Prepare to get schooled in my Austrian perspective We've been going back and forth for a century I want to steer markets I want them set free There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it Play more interest no, rates no, It's the animal spirit You said, uh, what, what uh, phrase has become well known? Well, among so certain circles, prepare to get schooled in my Austrian perspective um, it appears on more than one email signature. <laughs> Why? You know, um, Austrian economics, which again is not about the country of Austria, but just this lineage of um, these thinkers, Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and, and others. Menger. Uh, and, you know, Karl Menger, they just, mo for the most part, came from Austria. Uh, you know, that was the mainstream before Keynes. That, they were the guys. They, and they had a big impact on economics, but since the Keynesian Revolution, they've been very much relegated to the sidelines. And so like any group that sort of feels they're on the outskirts, you develop, you develop a very loyal following. I mean, I'm an Apple guy, and Apple's mainstream now, but it wasn't always. So, you know, and, and, you know a good slogan goes a long way for people that feel like they're maybe not getting heard. <laughs> I have to confess that when I got into preparing for this show, I started to drown in all the different websites and blogs and all that. And we talked earlier about Cafe Hayek. I want to ask you again, what's that? That's my blog that I do with Don Boudreau about the issues of the day, economic issues of and the day. And you're based at George Mason Correct. University teaching yep. what level? Undergrads and grads. Teaching what course? Uh, this semester I'm teaching a seminar on Adam Smith to both graduates and undergraduates. Did they have to watch your videos? No, <laughs> but they all, they're all fans. They, they, they told me about how it's doing more than, than I'd find out on my own. They, they like it. And Econ Talk, again, is what? That's my weekly podcast that comes, uh, it's sponsored by Liberty Fund. Uh, it comes out every Monday morning at 6.30 a.m., interviews with economists, authors, everyday people, business leaders. Talking how many about of them are there? Uh, there's over 250 in the archives. We keep every one of them up online. Uh, Liberty Fund's very... Uh, interested in education, so they're all they're up there without any charge. Is there one of them or two of them that have really taken off and where their numbers are bigger than the rest over the years? Well, I, 
I interviewed Milton Friedman twice. That's those are still popular. I interviewed Nassim Taleb three times. Uh, I hope I'll interview him again. Those are very popular. But maybe my most popular guest is Mike Munger of Duke University. Mm -hmm. He's actually the security guard in that opening scene of Fight of the Century. So uh, he and I have a great rapport. We have a lot of. He's been on, I think, 19 times on the on the program. And tell us again who he is. Mike Munger is a professor of economics and political science at Duke University. He's a frequent guest on my podcast, Econ Talk, and we cast him as the security guard. And he's the chauffeur in the first one. Yeah. He's, he just—he's a big fan of the videos. He, we're buddies. He wanted to be part of it. So, Mike is—he's—he's uh, he's got cameos in both of them. What has been the most enjoyable part of this for you? It's hard to to have one thing. I think maybe the the most enjoyable part is to see that we are actually having an impact on the world in, the po in what I think is a positive way. People are talking about these ideas and they feel empowered. And, you know, as Russ said, we've gotten s so much mail, or I, not real mail, but um, <laughs> email and Facebook messages from, from, from people that are discovering economics in the way I did, but through our videos. And so to sort of have discovered these ideas in this bizarre way for myself, the serendipitous sort of set of circumstances, and then to be able to contribute back to that sort of community and that pool of knowledge is just, it's, a, it's really amazing. I mean, I get sort of emotional thinking about the fact that I'm privileged enough to get to do this. What's next? Uh, I don't know. You know, when we, we did the end of that, we were very... We spent a lot of time thinking about that last 30 seconds, and it might be the last time that we see Keynes and Hayek on the screen. And I, it's funny, we, you know, we know Billy and Adam personally, but to me and probably to John, they're Keynes and Hayek, and, uh, and we're saying goodbye to them really at the end of that. Probably, you know, there's always a temptation to write a third one. You never know, but maybe, maybe not. So, I think for the next, for the future, I hope John and I'll collaborate on something, something different when we're still talking about it. Why do you think it's the end of Hayek and Keynes on, on this video project that you've got? You know, I think that we managed to cover a lot of ground with these two. And I think that the best thing we could do for them, for Keynes and Hayek, for these videos and for the ideas, is to give them a chance to be covered and to, you know, to explore the ideas that, that surround them. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff in these two videos. There's a century's worth of study. Um, and there's other issues to cover. So I, I won't count out the possibility of a return, but you know what? Sometimes it's good you go away from them and then when they come back, it's like, uh, you know, Indiana Jones Part 3. You just, <laughs> you're that much more excited to see them return. <laughs> John, Pop we were talking about this earlier, Papola. That's right. But it could be... Papola, it could be. Papola, you're Italian I by... Am. And Russ Roberts, uh, John Papola is from New Jersey. Russ Roberts is from here at George Mason University, uh, teaches economics. And again, you can find these videos on youtube.com. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next.